Hi there, and welcome to The Daily Gardener, and thank you for listening. I'm your host, Jennifer Ebling. It's February 10th. Today, we celebrate the man who suggested naming the twin flower for Linnaeus and the botanist who gave Meriwether Lewis a crash course in botany. We'll learn about the English writer who wrote that God once loved a garden we learned in holy writ and seen gardens in the spring. I well can credit it. And we also tip our hats to the British botanist who loved the common spotted orchid. Today's unearthed words feature words about the white stuff covering our gardens right now, snow. And we grow that garden library with a book about a family who settled in the Florida frontier. The book was honored as the most outstanding Florida historical novel. And I'll talk about an item that will help you spruce up a number of items in your garden. I love this product. And then we'll wrap things up with a pioneer naturalist who wrote books that became a beloved part of many modern childhoods. But first, let's catch up on a few recent events. Here's today's curated articles. First up is a post that was featured in Country Life. It was written by Alan Titchmarsh, and it was called The Stunning Midwinter Trees, Whose Bark is Better Than Their Bite. This post was all about the fabulous book Winter Gardens by Cedric Pollitt. Pollitt is a shutterbug who captures plants in their dormancy. Quote, the best varieties of dogwoods, willows, maples, and birches, plus a smattering of brambles and bamboos. Pollitt's book was awarded the Garden Book of the Year by Garden Media Guild in 2018. And Alan Titchmarsh's review of the book was very positive. He wrote, I cannot think of a single recent gardening book that has fired my imagination and been such a useful guide to the diverse array of deciduous trees and shrubs and their colorful barks as Winter Gardens by Cedric Pollitt. I defy any gardener not to be uplifted by the superb images of plantings in gardens across the United Kingdom with the sprinkling of others across the water in Europe and North America. And I love how Titchmarsh ends his review He said that Pollitt's book was loaded with practical advice aplenty and images that are capable of making the most world-weary gardener sit up and take notice. Winter Gardens is a reminder that these dark months, which with age seem to last longer and longer each year, really are capable of being lifted out of the mire with thoughtful planting. We are none of us too old to discover new plants and new ways of using them. So there you go, a resounding endorsement for the book Winter Gardens by Alan Titchmarsh. I've included a link to it in today's show notes, and you can support the show by using that link and buying the book on Amazon. And right now, used copies are available for under $5. Now, that's tremendous for this book, and that's about 80% off the cover price for this book. Now, if you'd like to read Alan's review of Winter Gardens, just search for the word winter in the Facebook group for the show, and this post will pop right up. The other post that caught my attention this week was called Plant Health Resolutions by Pippa Greenwood. Greenwood is a botanist, author, and broadcaster, and she's a respected authority on plants and the pathogens which threaten their survival. 
in this profile of Greenwood, she was asked, can you sum up just how important healthy plants are for people and the planet? Pippa responded, you could say that plant health is the most important thing as the human race cannot survive long term without plants. In fact, we couldn't survive for long at all. Plants are fundamentally important to everything. Increased movement of people, food, and other goods has played a significant part in the spread of pests and pathogens. Quite simply, we have to take steps to ensure plant health is seen as a top priority. Anyway, this was a nice little post about Pippa and plant health. If you'd like to read more about this quick little interview with her, all you need to do is search for the word Pippa, P-I-P-P-A, in the Facebook group for the show, and this post will pop right up. Now, if you'd like to check out these curated articles for yourself, you're in luck because I share all of them with the listener community in the free Facebook group for the show. It's called the Daily Gardener Community, and it's completely free. And if you'd like to join it, the next time you're on Facebook, just head on up to the search bar, type in Daily Gardener Community, and request to join then I'll get a notification on my phone and then I'll admit you to the group. I look forward to meeting you there. Here's today's brevities. Today is the birthday of the Dutch botanist Jan Grenovius, who was born on this day in 1686. Grenovius's story is inextricably bound to the Virginia botanist John Clayton. Clayton botanized Virginia. In the early 1700s, Clayton sent specimens to Grenovius, both directly and indirectly through the English naturalist Mark Catesby. Grenovius was a little in over his head as he attempted to make sense of the overwhelming amount of specimens from Clayton. So he did what most of us would do. He asked for help and he got it from Carl Linnaeus. In a brazen move, Grenovius used Clayton's specimens and documentation to put together a flora of Virginia in 1739. He published the work without notifying Clayton, and he certainly didn't seek his permission before he started the endeavor. Other than the Clayton situation, Grenovius is remembered for the many plants he named. After seeing the twin flower, it was Grenovius who suggested naming the plant after Linnaeus. Without Grenovius, Linnaeus probably wouldn't have had a plant named for him during his lifetime. Linnaeus was very modest, and bless his heart, Grenovius was sensitive to Linnaeus's need to keep the honorary naming low-key. So Grenovius wrote that the twin flower was, quote, a plant of Lapland, lowly, insignificant, disregarded, flowering but for a brief space after Linnaeus, who resembles it. Thus, the twin flower is the only plant named for the father of taxonomy, Linnaeus, and it has the name Linnea borealis. Another plant that Grenovius named was the genus Gerbera, which was named after the German botanist Traugott Gerber. Finally, in 1739, it was Grenovius who combined the words for water and jug, hydro and angion, put them together, and you get hydrangea, which translates to water jug. Little fun fact there. 
Today is also the birthday of the American botanist, naturalist, and physician, Benjamin Smith Barton, who was born on this day in 1766. Barton worked as a professor of natural history and botany at the University of Pennsylvania, where he authored the very first textbook on American botany. In 1803, Barton tutored Meriwether Lewis to get him ready for the Lewis and Clark expedition. Lewis had little knowledge of natural history and plants, and Barton's expertise made it possible for him to be quite effective on the expedition. Barton was supposed to create a book describing all of the plants that were found on the expedition, but for some reason, he never began writing. The job ultimately fell to Barton's assistant, Frederick Persch, who ended up having a falling out with Barton. Persch took copies of the specimens and went to England, where he found a patron and published his Flora of North America, much to the chagrin of Benjamin Smith Barton and other botanists. And there is a fun story that came out last year in February about this time, and it was about a little yellow butterfly that was found pressed between the pages of a Barton manuscript, his Flora Virginica from 1812. It turns out that this little yellow creature was found by a library fellow named E. Bennett Jones at the American Philosophical Society as he was looking through the book. Butterfly experts felt that the placement was purposeful since the butterfly was found in between the pages listed plants beloved by pollinators such as Monarda. After the discovery, the Barton butterfly was carefully removed and preserved in a suspended container. In a touching result, the manuscript will forever bear a butterfly-shaped stain, marking the spot where the little butterfly was pressed between its pages for over 200 years before it was discovered. And today is the birthday of the English writer Winifred Mary Letts, who was born on this day in 1882. Gardeners love her quote on spring. She wrote, That God once loved a garden, we learned in holy writ, and seeing gardens in the spring, I well can credit it. Winifred also wrote a poem about spring called Spring the Cheat. This is one of many poems Winifred wrote about the Great War, World War I. Winifred wrote Spring the Cheat to remind people that they were not alone in their suffering. Her poem illustrates how pointless existence seems during wartime. Winifred contrasts the season of rebirth, spring, which is cyclical, with a war-induced season of loss, which usually spreads across many seasons and is especially at odds during spring. Here's Spring the Cheat by Winifred Mary Letts. The witch elm shakes its sequins to the ground. With every wind, the chestnut blossoms fall. Down by the stream, the willow warblers sing, and in the garden, to a merry sound, the mown grass flies. The fantail pigeons call and sidle on the roof, a murmuring of bees about the woodbine-covered wall, a child's sweet chime of laughter. This is spring. Luminous evenings, when the blackbird sways upon the rose and tunes his flagellet, 
A sea of bluebells down the woodland ways. Oh, exquisite spring, all this, and yet, and yet, kinder to me, the bleak face of December, who gives no cheating hopes, but says, remember. Today's the birthday of the British botanist and former director of the Royal Botanic Gardens Q, Jack Heslop Harrison, who was born on this day in 1920. Jack became the first director of the Royal Botanic Gardens to resign the position since it was created in 1822. In 1957, Jack wrote an article on the hybridization of the common spotted orchid. Today at Kew Gardens, there's a marker for the spotted orchid, or the marsh orchid as it's known, with the Latin name Dactylariza x brownii. It was Jack's favorite flower. In unearthed words, here are some poems and quotes about snow. This first one's from Aristotle, the Greek philosopher and polymath. To appreciate the beauty of a snowflake, it is necessary to stand out in the cold. And here's a Korean proverb. There is no winter without snow, no spring without sunshine, and no happiness without companions. And here's a little excerpt from the poem called The Snow Shower by the American Romantic poet William Cullen Bryant. Here delicate snow stars out of the cloud come floating downward in airy play, like spangles dropped from the glistening crowd that whiten by night the Milky Way. And finally, here's a line from Nancy Hatch Woodward, the American writer, from Her Southern Snow. There is a silence in a snowy dawn that forces you to look anew at what has been transformed from the customary landscape of your day-to-day -day life. Dogwoods glisten in their silver finery. Bowing fur limbs form a secret cathedral. It's time to grow that garden library with today's book, A Land Remembered by Patrick D. Smith. This book came out in 1996. A Land Remembered is a multi-generational saga, and it tells the story of a family who settled in the Florida frontier and survived against all the odds and the land itself. In the story, the McIvey family arrived by ox cart in Florida in the 1850s. Settling on the banks of the Kissimmee River, they fought off mosquitoes, floods, freezes, and rustlers. In addition to telling the story of the McIvey family, Smith writes poignantly about another character, the Florida landscape. Specifically, Smith tells us how Florida looked in the beginning, before the pioneers came and settled the land. Smith highlights how the Florida landscape has been irrevocably altered by development and destroyed by greed over the past two centuries. A Land Remembered has won many awards as a work of Florida historical fiction. This best-selling novel has been reprinted multiple times over the years. You can get a copy of A Land Remembered by Patrick D. Smith and support the show using the Amazon link in today's show notes for under $5.
And here's today's great gift for a gardener. It's the Catsco Furniture Repair Kit Wood Markers. You get a set of 13. These are markers and wax sticks with a sharpener. Now, most people use them for stains or scratches on their floors, tables, and desks. And I do that as well. But I also took a set out with me to the garden last year, and I found so many uses for them. They're really great to have in your garden toolkit. I use mine to help age and add patina to items in the garden. They're great for helping to tidy up items that have little bits of damage on them, like birdhouses or wooden crates or boxes, if you have any of those in your garden. I had a raised bed that had a little damaged corner and I was able to make it look a lot better with these wooden markers. And they're even great for touching up things like ironwork in the garden. So if you have some type of antique that's got scratches, nicks or scuffs or some cherished garden heirloom and you just want to make it look a little bit nicer, you can use either the markers or the wax sticks. And I think you'll be pleased with the result. This 13-piece kit includes six repair markers and six paper-wrapped wax sticks and one wax stick sharpener. Basically, it's a pencil sharpener. The colors are maple, oak, cherry, walnut, mahogany, and black. And both the markers and the wax sticks are easy to use. All you need to do is draw over the area that needs a little improving, allow it to dry, and then sit back and enjoy the results. This product is an Amazon choice. You can get it on Amazon Prime so you don't pay for delivery. And it's 100% satisfaction guaranteed by Catsco. So if you're not satisfied with the product, you can totally return it with a 100% no questions asked guarantee. And you can get the Catsco Furniture Repair Kit of 13 markers and wax sticks with the sharpener and support the show using the Amazon link in today's show notes for $9.99. Finally, here's something sweet to revive the little botanic spark in your heart. Today is the anniversary of the death of Laura Ingalls Wilder, who died on this day in 1957. One of the reasons so many of us have a soft spot in our heart for the Little House books is because Laura was so descriptive. She was a natural storyteller. In retrospect, I think you might be surprised by the amount of material in Laura's books devoted to the natural world, Ma's gardens, the landscapes that Laura and her family experienced, and her overall reverence for life, plants, animals, and human. All of it is so cherished by Laura and her loved ones. In 2017, the author Marta McDowell wrote a book called The World of Laura Ingalls Wilder. And in it, she highlights the frontier landscapes that inspired the Little House books. Marta's book sheds light on Laura as a naturalist. In a blog post, she challenged us by writing, I'd like to suggest a thought experiment. Instead of categorizing Laura Ingalls Wilder as an American children's author, Think of her as a nature writer as well. Long before she was a writer, Laura Ingalls Wilder was a gardener and a farmer growing food for the table and raising crops for sale. Nature was her home as well as little houses. Through her life and work, Wilder sowed a deep appreciation for the world outside one's own door. Her books still inspire budding naturalists to plant, preserve, and appreciate their own Wilder gardens.
Marta and I had a lovely chat that is featured in episode 585 of the Still Growing Podcast. If you'd like to check it out, I put a link to it in today's show notes. And you can get a used copy of The World of Laura Ingalls Wilder by Marta McDowell and support the show using the Amazon link in today's show notes for under $4. And I'll close today's show with a few words from Laura. In the Missouri Ruralist, Laura wrote, The voices of nature do not speak so plainly to us as we grow older. But I think it's because in our busy lives, we neglect her until we grow out of sympathy. Our ears and eyes grow dull and beauties are lost to us that we should still enjoy. Life was not intended to be simply a round of work, no matter how interesting and important that work may be. A moment's pause to watch the glory of a sunrise or a sunset is so satisfying, while a bird song will set the steps to music all day long. And over a hundred years ago, in early February of 1918, Laura wrote, Now is the time to make a garden. Anyone can be a successful gardener at this time of year, and I know of no pleasanter occupation these cold, snowy days than to sit warm and snug by the fire, making a garden with a pencil and a seed catalog. What perfect vegetables do we raise in that way? And so many of them. Our radishes are crisp and sweet, our lettuce tender, and our tomatoes smooth and beautifully colored. Best of all, there is not a bug or worm in the whole garden, and the work is so easily done. In imagination, we see the plants in our spring garden, all in straight, thrifty rows, with the fruit of each plant and vine, numerous and beautiful, as the pictures before us. How near the real garden of next summer approaches the ideal garden of our winter fancies depends upon how practically we dream, and how hard we work. Thanks for listening to The Daily Gardener. And remember, for a happy, healthy life, garden every day. The Daily Gardener is produced weekdays in lovely Maple Grove, Minnesota. You can find complete show notes over at thedailygardener.org. And be sure to share the show with your garden friends. You can find The Daily Gardener on all your favorite social media, Instagram, Twitter, and Pinterest, and of course, Facebook. While you're over at Facebook, don't forget to join The Daily Gardener community. Just search for these three words, Daily Gardener Community. The group will pop right up and then request to join. Finally, I want to thank my team at Podfly Productions, where my fabulous editor is Eric Begay. Have a great day in the garden, and we'll see you tomorrow.